One of the biggest investment mistakes that I made right out of college was not investing in a health savings account. Granted, I did recently retire at the age of 46, but I could have done it a lot sooner if I would have invested in an HSA right out of college. Look, it doesn't matter if you're 20, 60, or any age in between. An HSA should be part of your investment strategy if possible. I say if possible because you need to be enrolled into a high deductible health plan or an HDHP, which allows you to have a health savings account, where the funds can then be invested into things like CDs, treasuries, mutual funds, ETF, and even stocks. But you should only consider having a high deductible health plan if you're relatively healthy and you don't plan on having any high medical bills in the near term, like when having a baby. For reference, check out this chart that shows you where your peers are at for the percentage of US population that have an HSA. If you're watching this, then there's probably an 80% chance that you do not have an HSA. And I'm hopeful that by the end of this video that I'll convince at least some of you to strongly consider to have an HSA, at least if you're healthy. In today's video, I want to go over with you why you'll want to invest in an HSA account at any age below 65 or if you're not on Medicare. The moment that you sign up for Medicare, you can no longer contribute to an HSA account. For everyone else, if you're 30 years old or younger, there is no reason why you can't retire at 65 with at least a million dollars in your health savings account. And many of you will probably be thinking, but Brian, it's a health savings account. Why would I want that much money? It's something that I can only apply towards medical bills. Because HSAs don't force you to only spend money on medical bills. That's the part that many people have wrong. Most people also don't realize that an HSA is not a use it or lose it account, meaning that it rolls over each year and even if you leave your employer, it will always follow you, just like your 401k. I plan to cover the requirements, the details on having a health savings account, the contribution limits, how to invest the funds, and lastly, the two major pitfalls that a lot of people make with an HSA. So make sure that you stick around for those pitfalls because if you make those mistakes, I guarantee you it's gonna cost you thousands of dollars. I'll also cover tips and tricks on having an HSA and provide some examples along the way that showcase why you'd want one at different stages and ages of your life. Clearly, there are some things that I would have done differently with my HSA, so take notes, you can learn from that. To begin with, a health savings account is an account where you set aside pre-tax money to aid in paying your medical expenses. So what does pre-tax mean? It means that the money that you contribute to your HSA account is not counted towards your taxable income when you do your taxes at the end of the year. Said another way, all the funds that you contribute to your HSA reduces your taxable income by that amount. These accounts can only be created if you're on a high deductible health plan or an HDHP. A high deductible health plan predominantly has much lower premium cost to you, but the out-of-pocket deductible is crazy high. According to the IRS for 2023, a plan can be labeled as an HDHP if the minimum deductible is at least $1,500 per person or $3,000 for a family. Please remember that a deductible is the amount that you're responsible for paying each calendar year towards your medical bills before the insurance kicks in to pay any of the bills. In addition, the maximum out of pocket per individual is $7,500 or $15,000 for a family. But your plan could have a higher deductible or a lower maximum out of pocket requirement and still be an HDHP. Your employer health plans should explicitly state if the offered plan is a high deductible plan or not. But if you're not sure, then reach out to your HR rep to find out more details. Typically, the employer plan will state whether or not it's an HDHP, and in many cases, the employers will match funds up to a certain dollar amount. For example, one employer that I had would match the first $1,000 to my HSA. So if I put in $2,000 into my HSA, then my employer would also put in the full match of $1,000, bringing my account total to $3,000 for that year. As another example, if I only contributed $500 into my HSA over a year's time, then my employer would only contribute $500 to the account as well. In this situation, it would be in my best interest to put in the maximum match to capture the full $1,000 from my employer because it's free money. And as of today in our current health plan, my wife's employer automatically deposits $900 a year without requiring any funds to be matched. And if you and your family are healthy, this is absolutely money that you should be taking advantage of. Something to also take note of is that an employer's contribution does count towards your max HSA contribution each year, which leads me to the max HSA contributions in 2023 for an individual to be $3,850 and $7,750 for a family. But if you're 55 years or older, you can add an extra $1,000 catch up to those total contributions contributions, bringing it to $48.50 for an individual and $87.50 for a family. As a quick example of my situation in 2023, our family max contribution is $77.50, but my wife's employer, as I mentioned, automatically deposits $900 to the account. If we want to max out our contribution for the year, we would only be responsible for a total contribution of $68.50, since the employer's contribution of $900 does count towards our max. I will now go over the major advantages of having an HSA account. First, the funds contributed to an HSA carry over every year 
the funds are not a use it or lose it situation. In addition, the funds in your HSA account can be invested and grown over time. Next, the HSA funds are triple tax advantaged, meaning that the contributions are tax deferred and reduce your taxable income. The funds that are invested grow and compound tax free. And lastly, when you withdraw the funds and use it towards medical expenses, the funds used are completely tax free. On top of all those great benefits, the HSA account completely changes its advantage when you turn 65. Because when you turn 65, you can then withdraw the funds from your HSA account and spend it on things other than medical expenses without any penalty. You would simply have to pay income tax on the withdrawn funds. And that's what makes the health savings account one of the best investment accounts you can possibly own. On top of all of that, like a 401k account, your HSA can have beneficiaries. So when you pass away, your account can then be passed on to the rest of your family. Now, before I get too far, I need to overtly state that a health savings account is not to be confused with a flexible spending account or an FSA. This happens to be a mistake that many people make, and I get it. The reality is you only review your health plans once a year, and it's tough to remember all those details. Here's a quick snapshot on the differences between the two. As you can see, an HSA is owned by you and the FSA is controlled by the employer. Next, the contribution limits are quite a bit lower for an FSA. If a health plan falls under the guidelines of an HDHP under the IRS code, then you can have a health savings account. An FSA account is purely available at the discretion of the employer. Both accounts can be used for medical expenses and contributions are pre-tax dollars, but an HSA can be used for Medicare premiums and long-term care premiums while an FSA cannot. But the major difference is that an HSA account is always yours and whatever is in your account at the end of the year carries over to the next. Whereas an FSA is a use it or lose it account. Whatever you don't spend at the end of the year, it's lost. Another big difference is that the HSA account can be invested into things like mutual funds, ETF, and even stock. Where an FSA cannot. But wait, there's more! And all of the HSA funds that are invested can grow tax-free. But wait, there's more! By the funds growing in the investment tax-free, it essentially means you can sell stock and then reinvest it without having to pay any of the capital gains tax. And that's the magic. While I was working at Amazon, I did have an FSA health plan on a couple of different occasions, and every year it turned into this crazy spending spree trying to use up all of these FSA funds. It seems like an FSA forces you to buy a bunch of junk at the end of the year if your family happens to be healthy. I'm now gonna move on and go over a few examples of where an HSA makes sense and when it doesn't. After that, I'll go over the actual process and the steps associated with an HSA account and the steps that you may need to take in order to invest those funds. After that, I'll go over a couple of pitfalls with HSAs that you need to watch out for. Let's play a little game of is this HSA for you? So in our first example, let's say that you're married and you and your spouse are planning to have a child next year and you need to choose your health plan. To give you context, the average cost of childbirth is roughly $19,000. Or if you're like us and your child arrives a month early, then the cost is $200,000. Now let's say your employer gives you three options for a medical plan. The first is a PPO where if you use in-network care, then your deductible is $500 and the max out of pocket is only $2,500. And the premium cost is $375 a month for the family. The second option is an FSA where there's a $1,200 deductible and a max out of pocket of $6,000. And the premium cost is $300 a month. And your last medical plan option is the HSA where the deductible is $3,500 and a max out of pocket is $14,000. But your premium is only $175 a month. Which one do you choose? Let's break down the annual cost and the expected medical bills to make a better decision. The PPO has an annual premium of $4,500 and let's assume that you take on the max out of pocket at $2,500 during the childbirth. Total expected spend at the end of the year is $7,000. With option two of an FSA, your annual premium comes out to be $3,600 and your max out of pocket is $6,000. Let's assume that you max out your FSA contribution. Then your total out of pocket for healthcare that year would be 9,021. And for the third choice of the HSA, let's say that your employer chips in $1,000 and you max it out at 7,750. But in this case, you only had to pay 6,750. The annual premium cost is $2,100 and you have the max out of pocket of $14,000. If your childbirth is average, then your total medical cost this year with an HSA would be $14,818. This is nearly the same scenario that my wife and I came across when we were about to have our children. And in both cases, we chose to flip our insurance over to the PPO, which saved us $2,000 over the FSA account and over $6,000 from the HSA account. A person can argue that the money in the HSA could be worth three times that if it was invested, but 
That could also be true of the money that we save from using the PPO. This is exactly the type of breakdown that you should be doing every year when you're choosing your medical plan with your own expected medical costs and taking into account what your effective tax rate is. If you have extremely low medical costs, then a high deductible health plan may make good sense for you. Simply because with an HDHP, you're responsible for the majority of all the medical expenses out of your own pocket. In another example, let's say that you contribute the max amount into your HSA as an individual at 3850, and if your effective tax rate is 20%, then you have a tax savings of $770. If your annual medical costs are $770 or less a year, then it is complete cream where you're going to be net positive with your HSA. But let's talk about the mechanics of what happens when you sign up for a high deductible health plan. If you are selecting this type of plan for the first time where you are allowed to have an HSA, then typically your employer already has a preferred HSA bank where your account will be set up for you. A lot of times the HSA bank account is run by a subsidiary of the insurance provider. And a question that often pops up in my mind is, are any of these employers getting kickbacks from these HSA banks? I don't know the answer, but since many of the HSA banks are attached to the insurance provider, it really does make you wonder. But I digress. Now something to pay close attention to is when these HSA funds are being deposited into the HSA bank account, they're typically in a zero interest account, meaning the funds aren't growing or working for you in any way. Many of these HSA banks allow you to invest your money into a couple of curated mutual funds, but, and it's a big but, that does not happen unless you specifically go to the HSA bank to investigate your options and choose what to do with those funds. If you like what they offer for investment options, then great. But if your HSA bank doesn't have investment options or you don't like the options available to you, you should have the possibility to transfer them to an HSA investment account of your choice. I've personally used two different HSA account entities that have allowed me the largest opportunity to invest my money. And those entities happen to be Fidelity and Lively. And I'll take a moment to explain why I liked or used both of them. One of my employers had the HSA bank set up with Lively, which leverages Schwab brokerage account for all the investment needs. An account with Lively allows you to either make your own investment choices into stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or even ETF. So long as you have a balance above $3,000, the Schwab investment investment option is completely free. But if you have less than that, then they do charge you $24 a year, which isn't breaking the bank, but just know your fees. The second option with Lively is for you to have an actively managed portfolio, but they do charge you an expense ratio of 0.5% annually. What I love about the Lively site is that it's dedicated to HSA account holders just like you, so you can invest your money. And any amount that isn't invested is FDIC insured. And since the site is dedicated to HSA account holders, it provides you a great resource like calculators, HSA guides, and eligible expenses that you can use on your HSA account. The other HSA account that I use is with Fidelity, and they are a fantastic option if you're a knowledgeable investor. They don't offer you all the extra resources and the calculators that Lively does, but Fidelity does offer you the universe when it comes to investment options. The downside is that it can be a bit overwhelming if you don't already have a Fidelity account. Overall, Fidelity and Lively are the two accounts that I use, and I, I do recommend them based on my own personal experience. The account that your employer offers may be all that you need, but if you don't like it, then look to move your account elsewhere. Hey, it's your money to manage the way you prefer. Do not feel like you're stuck with what you're given. Feel free to shop around. Now I'll go over a few more examples and then I'll finish it off with HSA mistakes that you need to avoid at all costs. For the first example, let's say that you're 25 years old, just graduated college, and you are extremely healthy. Let's say that you have no intention of getting married and you maximize your HSA account every year until you're 65. I'm going to use the calculator from the Lively site that I mentioned earlier to illustrate how this shakes out. Let's say that you live in California and your average income is $100,000. Since you're healthy, we'll say your annual HSA expense is $0 and you paid everything out of pocket. Taking a bit of a sidestep, the S&P 500 has had an average return of 10.7% since 1957. So for that reason, I'll choose 9% return in the calculator just to be a little conservative. When you're 65, you would have a whopping $1.2 million in your HSA account. You would have invested a total of $146,000 over 40 years, resulting in over a million dollars. And if your employer has HSA matching funds, then it is purely free money that you've invested and grown over time. Now, keep in mind that you can use these funds for medical expenses without paying any taxes at all. But in addition to that, since you're over the age of 65, you can now pull these funds and use them towards living expenses without paying any penalty and you'd only have to pay for the income tax on the withdrawals that don't go towards your medical expenses. For this next example, let's say that you're 25 and married with all of the same details as before, but this time you plan to retire at the age of 45 and max out your family contribution. At the age of 45, the balance is going to be roughly $373,000. If you want to retire early, this makes the HSA extremely important because buying insurance outside of an employer for a family of four will be roughly $1,500 a month. At this rate, the 
interest and just the interest from your HSA investments would more than cover your insurance costs until you reach the age of 65 and then you qualify for Medicare. If you have any plans to retire early, then you absolutely need to incorporate an HSA account to help pay for those future medical costs. I'm going to give you one more example and then I'm going to speak to the mistakes that you need to watch out for with HSAs. In this next example, let's assume that you're 40 years old healthy, and single living in New York. If you contribute the max amount until you are 65, then your investment will be roughly $309,000. Once again, the interest, and just the interest, from your HSA investments would more than cover your insurance premiums for the rest of your life. The point with these examples is that regardless of your age, there is still value in having an HSA account so long as you're healthy and without major medical expenses. However, it should be obvious that the sooner you start saving for your HSA account, the more time it has to let that compounding interest work in your favor. Like I said at the beginning, if you're 30 years old or younger, and if you qualify for an HSA, then there is no reason you shouldn't be an HSA millionaire when you retire. Now let's cover the major pitfalls with HSAs that you need to watch out for. The first one that I mentioned earlier is that even if you have an HSA bank account, it doesn't mean that your funds are being invested. I have spoken with friends that had HSA accounts for years, and they did absolutely nothing with their funds. They assumed, like many people, that it was set up to be invested, or they didn't know that they had the choice to invest those funds in the first place. Another major mistake that I see from people is that they confuse an HSA with an FSA, and then they spend all of the HSA account balances at the end of the year because they think it's a use it or lose it account. Always remember that the HSA account carries year over year and that the account is owned and managed by you, the individual, never the employer. The next major pitfall to avoid is don't ever withdraw your funds from your HSA account for anything other than medical expenses before you're age 65. If you take out those funds before age 65 and it's not for medical expenses, it's gonna hurt. The first penalty is that you will pay income tax on the withdrawn funds, and let's say your effective tax rate once again is 20%. The next formal penalty for early withdrawal when not used on medical expenses is 20%. Bringing that all together, the total impact is gonna be a penalty of 40%. So let's say you're 60 years old and you pulled $10,000 from your HSA account and it wasn't used on medical expenses. The penalties and the tax would account for $4,000, leaving you with only $6,000. These are all mistakes with an HSA that you do not want to make. That concludes my video on the importance of having an HSA as an investment account. I hope you were able to get some value out of my video and thanks for watching.